So welcome everyone. Good evening. It's uh, overwhelming having again such a big audience, uh, which is uh, in fact too big for our spaces, but uh, I'm pretty sure we're working on that problem as well. Uh, now let me shortly introduce uh, today's speaker, Hani Rashid, although he is not uh, unknown in this house, uh, thank God. Uh, he, together with uh, his partner Lisa Ann Kutre, uh, co-founded uh, Asymptote in the year 1988. He taught uh, at many of the most important architectural schools all over the world. Uh, among them, Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture and Planning, uh, the Royal Danish Academy in Copenhagen, uh, SciArc, uh, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University, Städelschule in Frankfurt, and uh, right now in Princeton. Uh, Asymptote's uh, project range from spatial experimentation and installations to building and urban design to computer-generated environments and architectures realized uh, in the US, in Europe, and in Asia. Ali Rashid also was one of uh, two US representatives who exhibited uh, in the American Pavilion at the Biennale in Venice in the year 2000. The work of Asimtut is to be seen in various uh, most prestigious museums and collections, including MoMA, uh, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, uh, the Canadian Center of Architecture, Netherlands Institute of Architecture, and uh, the Guggenheim Museum. A wonderful person, a great person, and uh, it is a good opportunity today not only to welcome him as today's speaker, but also to announce him as uh, the new professor of architectural design at the University of Applied Arts beginning from next semester. He will <laughs> so we will welcome Honey at least for the next three years, following Wolf Briggs as head of uh, uh, the Studios Three of Architectural Design. Uh, which uh, is, uh, will be not easy, uh, but uh, every change, I think, and I'm sure, is also a chance to go to no new dimensions uh, and uh, to secure the status of our university, of this Institute of Architecture, in the world highest league of architectural schools uh, we gained in the last uh, years, for sure. Thank you for coming and a very warm welcome. One additional thing I have to say, and it's uh, a pleasure for me to say, Wolf Briggs uh, will retire this summer as head of the architectural design studio at our Institute of Architecture. This uh, would be a good opportunity to talk about his merits, about uh, what he contributed to that, what our institute now is, about what he contributed, and it's uh, not the least what he contributed to to our situation we have 
worldwide. Uh, but uh, I don't use uh, this chance to praise what he did for this school in the past, uh, as uh, he will remain. Uh, he will remain not only as uh, a thesis advisor in our doctoral program, I thought uh, it would be a lost chance and uh, even more it would be a shame to leave him, to leave all his experience and his connections. And so uh, I had some talks with him in the last weeks and uh, we agreed that uh, he is ready to serve as <coughs> head of the institute, as dean, as non-teaching dean, uh, two more years at the Institute of Architecture, uh, a situation which will be new for this school, a situation which uh, will give this school the ability uh, to, to use the exceptional position of wood bricks in the world of architecture, not only locally but worldwide. And uh, I'm happy to announce that he will be uh, the next at uh, the, the existing and the next uh, head of the Institute of Architecture at the school uh, for the next two years. Thank you, Wolf. It's, uh, you know, I'm never speechless. <laughs> What's an I'm speechless. Uh, I am, I am uh, extremely happy and excited to, uh, to come to the school. I, um, you know, sometimes you wonder if you were able to design a program or a school or a, or a place where one studies architecture, you know, what would it be like? And uh, it was like walking into a ready-made. The school is, in fact, um, a ready-made, magnificent place to uh, teach and learn uh, architecture and, and other disciplines uh, related to that. So for me, it's an extremely uh, big honor and a big pleasure. And I now no longer have to run around the schools of <laughs> the Eastern United States. I will be here uh, quite a bit, and, um, and will work very, very hard with, with all of you or with my students. Um, I thought today I would uh, talk uh, a little bit about. Um, well, I gave a a little talk last week, if you recall. My mouse is missing. Uh, is it on the screen? Oh, there it is. Okay, I got it. Um, friends and enemies. <laughs> Does anybody know where this is? This is in uh, the Milan Galleria. It's uh, in, directly in the center of the Galleria, look how crazy, in Milan. And uh, it's a very strange thing. It's a bull uh, in the center of the, uh, of the this beautiful arcade that you all know. And if you sit and have a coffee nearby, um, you'll see businessmen walk past this bowl with their briefcases at 7.30, 8, 9 in the morning, and they do this. Walk. And they have this kind of strange ritual where they'll grind their feet into the bowl's private parts. Um, and so when I finally asked somebody, why, why does this happen? They said, well, it's a superstition that goes back a few centuries uh, that for virility, um, you should squeeze the, these parts of this book. Uh, make friends with the book, more or less, uh, at, at, the, at the center of the gallery. Um, so it's kind of amazing. There's this weird ritual where, uh, where people, uh, where men, businessmen, but the funniest part about it is that for some reason, young schoolgirls also come up to this book and do this, <laughs> and start jumping on this thing. Uh, so I don't know what that's about, but I thought it would be an interesting way to start the talk and uh, talk a little bit about uh, architecture. Uh, I, called, I called this talk uh, circuit training, um, and, and partially because I, I was trying to think of, as architects, what, what is it we do, and why do we do it, and how do we do it, in, in terms of, of what's different about our discipline and other disciplines, but also what's similar with other disciplines. And I think that, in a strange way, both teaching and working and practicing and thinking as an architect is a constant uh, type of circuit training. We are constantly going back and forth into concepts, ideas, uh, conceptual thinking, then we come out of that, we actually then run the circuit, we go back, we train again, 
And I thought that that's a, that's a kind of interesting analog to, to the work uh, that, that we take on. Um, this, is a, this is a chair that, that we uh, designed quite a few years ago, but the, the interesting thing about the, um, the architecture was that already in the sort of architecture of the chair and of the, of the human physique and body contained in that thing, there is this idea also of a continuous and, and uh, somewhat a powerful circuit around uh, the human body and its interaction with architectural space and with the making of space. Um, so I, I sort of thought, well, you know, let's then just run through some of the some of the architectural things that we've done and, and try and tie together an idea that in fact what happens in our discipline is a constant return, a constant spiral back to origins and then back out again into the into the space of making architecture. This is an installation I did uh, at the Guggenheim <coughs> few years ago um, for, for a, uh, a show called Moving Pictures. And it was an interesting commission. They had asked uh, us to design the, the interior of, the, of, of Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim. And really, it's a little difficult because you don't really want to uh, play around too much with that building. But we had to find a way to sort of intervene in a, in, a kind of, uh, in a kind of spatial way to make sense of the place. So one of the things we did besides uh, all the uh, installations was we, we would then carry all the work off the, off the surfaces of the of the museum, and we produce this kind of strange spiral condition that continues to uh, move down through the, through this the sort of building's architecture anatomy. And the thinking was that, in many ways, I think some some theories about there are many building theories about this building, but one of the ones that I always thought was interesting was, was the one that, in fact, it's a kind of a, a screw uh, being sort of put into uh, Manhattan near Central Park, and it was Frank Lloyd Wright's kind of attempt to uh, to really sort of produce a kind of infinite circuit. Uh, of, of, of viewing art, but really to sort of embed this thing into the city fabric. And so we continued that, and we found when we built this uh, very innocuous little, little thing that it became, in a way, a place for people to sit. It became a place for people to engage with their bodies, the spiral of the good. And in fact, it was one of the first times uh, that a lot of people, I don't know if you've seen this picture, but people started lying down and they would sort of hang out here. But it wasn't so much about the architecture that we were producing, it wasn't so much about the architecture that Frank was right had produced that we were working within. It was this idea that architecture, from our point of view, becomes a kind of a symbiotic, um, a, a sort of, a, has a symbiotic relation to the, to the existing spatial condition, and one then engages in a kind of spatial transfer or spatial uh, uh, situation, and is not necessarily uh, only looking at form or plasticity uh, or even at, at uh, just mathematical logic, but is actually engaged in some kind of a choreographed situation. Um, so, also, um, in the intervention, and again, this really is about a sort of, uh, a kind of caressing, if you will, of the, uh, of the building. It was not so much to destroy the building. This is, in many ways, many architects might consider this a kind of anti-architecture, because it was really a matter of just coming in and being very, very sort of uh, subtle and careful. So we added these galleries on, on the top floor for video art, because there's no way to show video art in this building uh, in, in the same way. And this was really just a matter, again, folding the geometry, producing these kind of acoustically controlled environments, picking up on the vents and actually using them to, to produce these little air uh, vents for the rooms. And in fact, there were many people who came up to this top rack who know the building quite well, um, who just kind of wandered through this without even realizing we had actually produced uh, a whole set of video galleries and spaces in the building. Um, and that's sort of the sense of what of the building is like. So, you know, I think in many ways then this idea that uh, you know, I, was, I was driving through um, Seoul, Korea, uh, not too long ago, and I, and I stopped in the taxi and I saw this sign at the window, and I, I kind of just had to, you know, stop and look at it again. And, and here's a Jeff Koons sculpture produced as an advertisement for a department store with a woman kind of straddled on the, on the Jeff Koons piece. And I thought, wow, art has really come a long way. It's, uh, it's become this kind of commercial, uh, you know, pop condition and in fact in many ways uh, can now just be kind of applied wholesale to any kind of a, a, a sort of a marketing uh, ploy. So in the spirit of that, and this was a little bit prior, but we, we were asked to do a, um, a little uh, intervention for the Guggenheim also in Abu Dhabi um, on Syed Island and we produced uh, a kind of idea for some galleries that would in fact start to work with the, uh, with the development with Frank Perry's building, with John Bell's building and others. And it started really as this kind of little sort of, uh, you know, sort of let's say, cell division. Um, and, and the idea that we would build two sort of 
enigmatic, strange, and, and art-like pavilions for the housing of art, but in and of themselves become these kind of curious fetish objects. Um, we produced a, a kind of a, a scaffold, a structural system to, to, to make these things actually work and stand, um, and, and a kind of structural system. And then thought about them as kind of perverse uh, objects of art themselves, that they would sit um, in the Abu Dhabi desert as kind of uh, on the site is kind of uh, strange, enigmatic, UFO-like perhaps, uh, uh, chromed uh, uh, sort of shells, and these things would contain contemporary art uh, and it would contain all kinds of uh, other things that we started to look at for electronic glass, for example, and so on. Um, and in a, in a strange way, um, th this speaks to a kind, of, uh, a kind of interesting, let's say, space that we exist in now between uh, architectural work and art, art production and where artists, now you find many artists who in fact are working as architects quite frankly and doing some, some remarkable things and you have architects uh, who in fact bridge, are bridging over into that other space. So the idea of producing uh, art galleries that are, in fact these were kinetic and so on, that could be both seen as uh, functional objects but at the same time kind of fetishized uh, you know, objects of desire sitting in, in the Abu Dhabi desert where we uh, key to us in the design of this little, this little project. Uh, this is on and off in terms of whether or not we're building it, but um, nevertheless, uh, the idea was to really uh, produce this sort of, uh, this kind of uh, instruments, let's say, in, in, that, uh, in that environment. And I showed a little bit of this last week, but I'll just quickly run through it. And, uh, but in terms of then that environment, what you have there really is, uh, is a, an unbelievably powerful environmental situation. You have, um, uh, you know, bright sunlight, you have uh, the extremes of culture, you have the, the meeting of the, of the Mideast with, with the West. Um, and so for us, uh, the, the chance to build a large project in the Abu Dhabi context, for, for this one in particular, the Ads Hotel, was a kind of interesting opportunity, not just to build another sort of five-star hotel, another kind of ad addition to the environment, but again, something that worked in this enigmatic space between uh, art and, and architecture, between desire and function, uh, and this was, in fact, the, the, uh, the grid shell of this, of this building in Abu Dhabi. Um, and the grid shell in and of itself is a kind of a field uh, sculpture. It, it's, uh, it's, it's shells and it's grid shell and, and the different sized panels and then these little LED lights that spring up in as kind of hairs or spikes. Uh, produce this very, a very strange uh, object in, in the Abu Dhabi context. It's, a, it's an object that somehow feels like uh, veils and, Clothing, but at the same time has a kind of animal-like quality as it sits in, in the desert context. Um, so, you know, what, what's mostly said about this building, um, from what I read on the internet, is that, you know, it's just the largest LEDs ever used, and some other silly remark, like, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, it's, it's uh, just really a kind of, or it's for five-star hotel dwellings, so but really, you know, from an architectural point of view, pure and simple. Uh, it was really to create a phenomenological artifact in the, in the desert condition that would, would actually... Reiner's not feeling very well. He's uh, <laughs> in need of some liquid. Hope you get better. <laughs> um, so this idea then to, to create a kind of fascinating object, a fascinating surface, was really driving, drove this project more than anything else. Um, as, it, as it comes over the roof, uh, and I'm just really... This is a kind of... For those of you who saw the... A week, a week ago to talk. This is kind of an extension, so I'm sorry I'm not going through all the kind of other stuff that I showed last week on this, but really what was, what was key here, and this, this is just important for us to understand, what was for us to discover really, was that even though the desire for this project started with a kind of seductive um, veil and, and, and sort of, you know, again, animal-like uh, uh, skin to this building, as we worked on it, we discovered things that are usually, that we bring to the front of the, of the sometimes, unfortunately. In the middle of designing this, our environmental engineers said, you know, you guys have created, in fact, by virtue of stack effect and updraft, a naturally ventilating condition around the building, much like a desert creature that has spikes and scales that keeps its body cool. So this, this where my son is walking here, is in fact an in always windy and always ventilated, even though the desert is still and, and, and stable. So this idea of a naturally cooling body was, was, a, was a kind of nice... Uh, plus, let's say, to, to the architectural desire, again, to build a surface. Similarly here, um, you know, another, and this is not often talked about in, in terms of what you see in the building, but the optical interference between the structure and the glass 
and the actual cars racing, because this house is a Formula One track that goes through, it's a very beautiful and almost hypnotic uh, situation with cars and the building interface. And, and in a strange way, what we discovered we did by virtue of um, approaching the design this way, sorry, um, was uh, that we created in a way a building that uh, has its own views. Uh, one, one of the questions that was asked to us prior to the finish of the construction was, well, we're putting this, you know, they were very nervous in one of these meetings, we're putting this five-star hotel in the middle of this Formula One track, what will people look at, you know, what will they see, there's no, there's no, you know, the monuments outside, it's just, just plain. And it was interesting because once the building opened, the building itself became this kind of reflexive um, views on, kind of narcissistic building in some ways. It, it's looking onto itself all the time and you find that looking at the building is actually the view uh, which, which sort of works. And its interiors were um, purposefully, at least the ones we controlled, because the proverbial, you know, sort of a, a hotel management company came in and decided to, to do the rooms their way. But as far as the uh, public spaces go, it was really a kind of play between, you know, sort of typical spaces and, and kind of artistic interventions that would, do, that would do similar things with light and space and form and furniture and very sort of simple uh, sort of accoutrements, textures, uh, architectural uh, devices to just make the spaces clean and, and kind of severe in a way, but also very sort of uh, circuit-like. Uh, the, the, the floor um, was in fact taken from a series of experiments we were doing with with uh, sort of a circuit drawing in terms of, of speed and cars, and it became a way of dealing with the entire floor as a kind of uh, architectural condition. The textures, the maps, the this is the, uh, the espresso bar at the lobby, again, was interfered with by texture, by, by, by sort of uh, various kinds of spatial and, and optical and material effects. Um, and here you see the lobby as we envisioned it, which again was a kind of atmospheric-like condition, and not, not necessarily a sort of typical uh, hotel lobby in the sense of, of it uh, sort of working function. And the interior is used, uh, you know, not only this idea of speed on the floors, but the, the screens themselves um, were taken from the, the, the sort of traditional trellis work that you find in Islamic uh, countries and cultures, but put through, of course, the 3D uh, milling machine and were able to produce these kind of algorithmic uh, veils that went over the restaurants and over the various sorts of uh, build, uh, functions of the ground floor. And the bridge, uh, which is where Formula One fanatics love to watch the race, uh, is this kind of uh, bridges over the track here. And from this one location that's separated by about five meters, four meters at the center, you can uh, view cars decelerating off of one turn, accelerating off another. So it becomes a very sort of interesting and intense place for, uh, for people to actually uh, visit. So here you see the bridge, you see the, the sort of uh, the lace-like structure uh, that, that covers the building. Uh, the building is in fact two buildings that are bridged over the track and one side goes into a marina, one side stays on the ground. And in a way, the, the building was really, um, and I said this last week, uh, was, was really not so much about its material uh, presence um, and physicality, although it's very sort of muscular and physical, but really also becomes a kind of place for, uh, for the event, for the various events, whether they're the marine events or, 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 uh, or any kind of, well they had a Miss World contest here, which kind of surreal, um, which we didn't design for, of course, but it becomes a place where, where people uh, sort of uh, use it now, and, and I noticed it on the advertising and so on. Here you see some more shots. And really here then you see this uh, <coughs> space where the building itself becomes part of the view. Um, the building plays a kind of a, uh, again, a kind of sensual game with the landscape, with, with the territory which it occupies, uh, and, and maneuvers really uh, around as a kind of body as a kind of body suit uh, around, around the building, around the, uh, the physical building. And the tracks um, are, you know, racing through here. This is, in fact, where you decelerate out of a turn, accelerate into another turn. Um, but I think this, this kind of sort of beautiful moment where the cars and the building uh, sort of merge or mesh um, is, is, is very, really kind of fascinating. And the gra even the graphics, which we didn't control, the graphics on the track, but I, I kind of fell in love with the graphics in, in the Abu Dhabi circuit because they kind of fit perfectly with the, <coughs> with the way our building was supposed to function and work. So in a way then, you know, as, as the building changes uh, through the night, it has this kind of LED system on it, and you know it very well here also. Um, it's sort of, again, it, to me, it, it becomes this fascinating place of, of, of a dematerialized building, a building which in fact, during events, uh, exists as a kind of blur, as a kind of a, 
uh, you know, something that's captured always as a sort of field condition behind uh, behind these uh, these fast moving and spectacular kind of cars and so on. Here you see on link, and here you see uh, Mr. Bettle uh, sort of racing through the through the bridge. This is, um, let me just go back there. Um, a few years ago, just to switch gears a little bit, um, I just, I wanna, I'm, I'm not going to switch sort of out of this kind of, let's say, curiously, and I consider the Yazoo Hotel small, I know it sounds strange, but it was kind of curiously small, fetishized objects into uh, larger, larger issues and projects, which to me are more and more interesting these days and becoming more and more our kind of, let's say, focus, which is urbanism in cities and new cities, new, new sort of ideas about uh, how we build cities, how we build cities from scratch, how we build cities, how we build cities in the past, how do we interpret cities. And this is a piece I did uh, at Documenta a few years ago, I think in 04, 06. Um, and I don't know if any of you saw this, but as you walked into the Documenta space, um, the, uh, the first thing you would see would be this, uh, this thing to run, right? The first thing you would see on the floor would be this map. Um, and this, this video map. And, and what we did was, we actually um, took all the skyscrapers from Hong Kong, Tokyo, New York City, and a few other cities, and mapped them into a, uh, into a very primitive, as you can tell, those of you who know computer animation uh, sort, of, uh, sort of developments, a very primitive animation system where we could actually run them as a kind of scroll over an object, over an object that was a kind of uh, metamorphed uh, automobile body, really. Um, and, then, and then see if we could, in fact, make this object read the city as a kind of digital data. The idea was to understand city space, not so much as we traditionally understood it, but more kind of taking off from Jonah Friedman and Constant, and produce a kind of space that, in fact, is reading the city uh, in terms of its, of its digital data, its phenomenal, its, uh, not really this one, its, uh, its, its phenomenological situation, and its reality as a kind of place of circumstance and so on. So this is um, the video of the installation when we walked in, and now I have nobody. Oh, it's me. <laughs> so when you walked in the space, the first thing you saw was this. Uh, uh, this was in Castle. You saw the, the kind of physical body of the, this, 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 this kind of morphed automobile, and then the cities would start to run on the surface. Um, and the soundtrack. Uh, the soundtrack was derived from getting conversations in elevators from friends around the world in these cities and just wanting to understand what the, what the sonic data was of these places. And then we attributed each voice to a skyscraper and then ran this like a kind of an optical reading machine so that when you walked in the space, you actually heard a kind of Cajun, uh, sorry, a kind of Cajun symphony. We cooperate. Uh, A kind of Cajun symphony, uh, which was really a kind of makeup of these. So you'd hear, you know, sort of strange noises that actually equated whether whether you're looking at Hong Kong, you heard a kind of Hong Kong symphony, which was the one you just heard. And so, so along those lines, we we uh, designed had a project to do the, a few years ago, a couple of months I want to go now, about a year and a half ago, um, for a very very big development project in Korea, and it's one of these mega projects, uh, mega development projects in, uh, in, in Seoul called Yongsan. And the very first kind of, and I was talking to Reiner about this today at lunch, that I, I, and it's another lecture which I'm going to try and formulate, but the very first thing, you know, that the sketches that were done for this project, and I've only noticed this lately because we have all of the sketches that I've done kind of cataloged now in the office, and they've changed dramatically over the years. In fact, there was a time when sketching stopped entirely, which was around the, the late 90s and into the early 2000s, because it all, it all became computer driven right off the bat. Everything was driven right into the computer. And then sketching sort of slowly started to come back into, into the work of our, of our studio. But the sketching changed. It became more notational systems for almost like musical scores for computer uh, instruction as opposed to actual formal sketches or, or buildings. And these were the first sketches that were sent through to, to start working on the, on the master plan, which was really um, just a series of, of strange scrolls both in plan and in elevation. Um, to try and produce uh, splines which could eventually become uh, sort of uh, formally manifest or, or modeled you know, into actual buildings and master plans and so on. And as we, as we sort of went through the, and I just, I, I showed you because of this discussion I was having today at lunch, but 
that the idea that the building design comes from these kind of notational drawings, which are really already thinking about the, the, the software we're using, whether it's Maya or Rhino or Grasshopper or whatever, at this time it's Maya and Rhino, uh, to, to kind of imply how we want the master plan to go and what, what it is we're looking for. And out of those sketches then the modeling starts, of course, and um, the first buildings we produced for the site were these buildings, and a couple of you here maybe we worked on them, um, and they were really just kind of uh, an attempt, and, and you have to understand, the competition here that we were up against, uh, for us it was a little bit surreal, we were up against SOM and the scheme, the, the, the Jurdy, you know, these kind of big firms, and we knew that they were all going to be uh, sort of, you know, uh, typical corporate stuff, and we had to sort of compete on those terms to win this thing. Um, so we went in and, and started to work on binary, sort of binary coded buildings, um, and as we, as we progressed through the project, we developed also a, a sort of super tower, 700 meter uh, tower for the center of the site, uh, as part of the, of the logic. And out of those sketches came this idea then of a bundling tower, a tower that in fact is, is three sorts of uh, bundles that pulled up, a very, very slender tower, which you see here on the, on the left. And, and that, that would reach up to the, to the 700 meter mark, would contain offices, hotels, uh, and all the various things that, that were part of this, uh, this project, and the various cores and so on. And this, this actually became quite an interesting, exciting part of the project. Despite, it was interesting because in fact it became uh, very viable. We were working with Fort Tomasetti in New York, and, and uh, it, it became very exciting when we started to move from a sort of you know, notational sketch to a conceptual drawing to an actual tower design that really could in fact stand at that height produce a kind of slender effect on the city um, and, and, and be in fact uh, built and manifest. And, and in fact, there was a lot of uh, uh, back and forth on this with the, with the client uh, as to whether or not we could build this tower. We're still working on it because the master plan was won by Daniel Lidestein, um, but you know, we're, we're always trying to push this one through because we thought it was kind of a strong component. But here you see the uh, various views of that tower. Um, and then, you know, just, just to take you back a little bit, the, in the process, the development then of the master plan around this tower, but a little bit like, uh, let's say, the bottle in space by Boccioni, the idea was to produce a kind of, uh, again, a kind of circuit, and a kind of circuit that would, that would revolve around the central tower and produce a field condition in three dimensions um, as a master planning scenario and as a way to, to control the geometry and control the master plan. And so this is what we, we sort of came up with. We had uh, developed plans like this for the various uh, buildings and landscapes, the, the groundwork, which in a way was a kind of circuit board uh, that, that started with the drawings, um, and then sort of studying the tower in that, in that place and the structural system that it could, that it could take, contain. And then this sort of you know, vision for, um, for Korea, for Seoul, perhaps. Uh, you know, manifest as a kind of a, a full uh, development of, of more or less uh, standard towers, but all working in a kind of field of twisted towers that in fact allow each other to, to produce uh, a very elegant objects. This project in Busan, Korea has just started again. The client actually, uh, this project was one of the projects that, that caused a giant sucking noise in my office about two years ago when the recession hit. Um, and as many projects kind of shot out the window, but all of a sudden, uh, our, our client in Busan has, has got us back on this. Uh, and the nice thing about it is that it went from uh, uh, th these visions for the original tower through a number of, and I'll show a few of them, a number of sort of uh, permutations and, and became more and more sort of, you know, gravitated towards being a single tower, which is what, of course, every, in fact, every client wants a single tower that gets very fat at the top, so they have lots of real estate at the top. Um, but we really were determined to produce this kind of tri triad uh, slender tower. And, and now, all of a sudden, uh, there's kind of an interest for it. So this is, you know, the kind of uh, bundling component, how this tower emerged, how it started, it went from that and eventually became three prongs. Uh, and then, uh, and then the, you know, the idea to bundle it, to bind it, uh, was very important, is how we could actually contain the core of it uh, and get it uh, to, in fact, uh, go up to 680 meters. Uh, in and, uh, and now this is the latest uh, iterations where the tower has actually started to bind, I guess you could say. It becomes more logical, and uh, I'm sure Klaus, you, you can see how it becomes more logical when it's bound at this level, as opposed to becoming a, a, a slender tower that could never stand. Uh, and contains still the sort of DNA of this, of this triple or triad uh, condition. Here you see the 
the entrance, and there you see the, the, the vision of the tower uh, in, in Seoul, in Busan. This project uh, we just completed in, uh, in, uh, in one city and uh, lost a competition. But this is an interesting thing, and I don't know if I should say this publicly, but a client came into our office, saw the project on the wall, and said they wanted it in another city. Um, which of course sent us into kind of a spin because you know we, we were brought up under the kind of idea that you would build and we, we believe this we build things for places that they're existing. The nice thing is that this city happens to be across the water from this competing city that decided not to build a building. So in a strange way we're kind of into the idea um, and we just started to relabel all the drawings uh, with the new city name on it. Um, but this is a, a port terminal. It's a port terminal um, on the water, and, and, and obviously, and, and the idea was really to create a kind of, um, and then, you know, just in terms of the, these, uh, if, you, if you just think back to the, the objects I showed in Abu Dhabi, and the Yaz Hotel, and the sort of, uh, the sort of spirit of these kind of uh, symbiotic uh, buildings that work in a kind of circuit condition with each other and continue to merge, the ship and the building here become a kind of unified agent or, or possibility for, for assembly. Um, the building is, in fact, um, I would say, the next generation of what we were doing on, on the Yaz building. Um, the circuitry and the, and the sort of, uh, the, the sort of uh, lines and, 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 and sort of determining architectural maneuvers are really based on, uh, on the idea that the ship's dock next to this building, that the, uh, that the sort of you know, the terminal is up elevated, that the ground floor of this building is elevated up to allow a kind of urban space. Um, to, to take hold and, and night markets and so on to be part of this building's uh, intervention and sort of, uh, uh, sort of merging with the city. Um, and with our engineers, we worked on and a lot of this going on these days, these kind of perforated uh, conditions. But in this case, we, we produced um, a system that in fact contains a series of bird like kites up above, and they actually adjust according to the light by virtue of a computer aided program, and they will actually fold and change to do different things in terms of light, of heat and light uh, abatement and control, uh, but produce really, and this is back to this idea of, of the grid shell set, it's a nice functional thing, but uh, at, at the end of the day, it's really a kind of very beautiful sky that we were able to uh, potentially build here in this, in this terminal that will be under a constant state of sort of animation and, and change. Uh, here are some shots into the study models um, of the building. It's, it's kind of, you know, again, understanding how it will work as a, as a sort of luminous object and, and how it becomes a sort of gateway to the city, um, how, how the towers uh, become lit and part of the environment and frame the, uh, the building itself, and the, uh, the sort of action and quality of the architecture um, as, as we continue to evolve uh, you know, you see various elements of the little spaces and so on. Um, and here you see the, the sort of Building's relation to the city by day, by night. Um, in fact, it's from the animation. So I guess the sound is going to come up. So just, just, uh, I'll just run this while we. Uh, sorry, I, I was going to edit this front part out. <laughs> Couldn't get it out of time. Um, but effectively, <coughs> the, uh, the 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 terminal uh, is really, in many ways, a, a kind of uh, play on on atmosphere and on the water and on the edge. Of, Ship. Here you see a uh, sort of opening shot on this, uh, very dramatic. You want to hear the, the last bit. It gets everybody very emotional. Um, but here's the, uh, the sort of surface that has a kind of wave-like, uh, uh, you know, ocean-like, uh, inf infinite quality to it. Um, and then the, um, the gangway bridge uh, and, and the relation of the bridge to the ships, uh, the undercarriage of, uh, of the building, the, the way the roof, in fact, will come out sort of meet the gangways that were kind of injected into the side of the building. Um, the ground urban space uh, that in fact bridges the city space with the, with the water um, on, on one side. Um, and the next shot is the interior gangway space itself, the actual artificial or, or let's say augmented sky uh, of the building. Uh, the, this is the public floor at the top uh, and a kind of, kind of light play that occurs through there. And here you see a sort of hand through the space um, and this kind of single uh, sort of held, structurally held canopy that is, that is held to the outside, uh, much like a, a kind of, uh, I guess, a, a brim, I suppose. Uh, and here you see the, the various sorts of levels of floors, the elevators uh, that connect the different, different 
levels through the departure and arrival halls, uh, and so on. So you, you get the idea. It's a, it's a kind of a, a building that, in fact, is, is in constant uh, spatial play and, and uh, dialogue with both the city and, and the actual ships and, and, and what takes place here. And I think it's very important, in a way, much like the, the hotel in Abu Dhabi, that the building gains a kind of uh, presence and a kind of power um, by virtue of, of marrying both the urbanism and, and the function that has to take place, and it becomes a, a sort of uh, a place of wonder and a place of, uh, of sort of uh, magic in many ways uh, for the city. Okay, and the last uh, last project on the show is the one we're now just getting. We just got the go ahead to uh, start construction in uh, in Holland. And I want to show this, uh, I actually a little bit about this last week. This is, uh, this man is uh, our client. He's 90, 99 years old next September. Uh, he is a uh, patron of the arts. He's, uh, he was friends with Winston Churchill. Uh, he treated the Indonesian Dutch Treaty. A uh, very, very important guy in the Dutch context. And he commissioned us to design a special building for him. And I'm just going to run the video here of him talking about, in the spirit of friends and enemies, and as a kind of reality check also about how important friends are um, and how important it is to know their enemies are, I guess, is, is this man, Peter Sanders, talking about a close relationship he had. How did you meet Carol Apple? Huh? How did you meet Apple? How did he meet him? How did they meet? In uh, Amsterdam. Before Copeland. Yeah, yeah, before, yeah. before the, the world. Uh, before the Copeland. Yeah. The Copeland was shortly after the war. Yeah, yeah. Immediately after the war. Apple, uh, Apple stole his, uh, his paints. Stole his paints for uh, he had no money to do to yeah. yeah. his paintings. Yeah. Yeah. And Peter has paid uh, his first uh, sure. his first production. And that's a lifetime adventure. Uh, oh, it was a present for him. So many classes are upstairs too, but also So what he's talking about uh, is um, his relationship to, to uh, Carol Apple and the, the Cobra Group, and how in 1937 he bailed him out of jail for he was stealing his paints all the time uh, to become a painter, and how they became lifelong friends. Um, I was touched by this commission. It's it's sort of a, uh, something that I. Show right now, just uh, in that what 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 uh, Peter, Mr. Sanders had asked for um, was a is a crematorium uh, for in in Skidam, in near near Rotterdam, um, and the idea really is that he wants to gift this building to the city of Skidam. Uh, we presented it last week to the mayor's office, to the various officials. Uh, it seems to be getting some some mileage now in terms of going ahead, and it's really a an interesting project because. In Peter's infinite sort of wisdom, amazing sort of generosity, he doesn't see it necessarily as a crematorium for any particular uh, sort of religion or even for himself necessarily, but rather as a place for multi-denominational. There are actually uh, twelve religions, um, twelve religions that more or less, and maybe more, that share this part of Sudan or this neighborhood. And so the idea is that the building is a is a kind of a place where people can go to commemorate the loss of a loved one. Um, or, or do other things, performance art, and so on here, in terms of the building, um, and that it would function for all the various religions. So for us it was kind of a key thing to come up with a scheme or a project that would um, really uh, speak to each particular culture, and then each, each particular culture would find within the building a sort of, uh, a sort of let's say, a kind of importance uh, for their own sets of beliefs. So it couldn't become a church, it couldn't be a mosque, it couldn't be a synagogue, it couldn't be a temple. Uh, Buddhist temple, uh, it had to really uh, be kind of across the board. So, you know, in the original sketches and ideas of this sort of, and again, a kind of circuit that the building was, was start out as becoming, uh, it, it quickly became apparent to us that we had to find a way to, in fact, um, impregnate the building with this, with this character of, of, of cultures and, and of life. And so the various, what you see here then, the various halls, which became sort of tattooed at first and eventually penetrated with uh, drawings that we started by putting together various uh, sort of, you know, sort of windows and mathematical, uh, let's say, uh, designs from various religions into a single perfor perforation pattern that would actually allow for the building to, uh, to, to sort of have that kind of meaning. It, the halls and the way it's planned is so that they could have various funerals and, and, and 
the situation is taking place at the same time. Um, I won't take into all the sort of planning of it, but, eventually, but effectively it's, uh, there's the crematorium part, there's the main hall, second hall, and the kind of reception area uh, where people will gather. Um, and, and then the kind of building um, exists in many ways as a sort of uh, kind of flower-like form, I suppose. But really what this is is a series of canals on the roof that will run uh, water uh, constantly through the building, uh, and it will be constant sound of water running into waterfalls and across the ceilings. Uh, across the, uh, the spaces, and then and then the kind of light that comes in through these these perforated openings that produce a very sort of important and sacred light again for all, all religions. And here you see the, <clears throat> the the pools and the rivers that allow the water to sort of drip down. Um, here you just see the sort of uh, the sort of attempt at understanding how we're going to manufacture the panels, uh, which now we have a sort of system in place. Uh, the, the carving, the, the marble that we use in parts for the building. Um, way that the building relates to the water and so on, relates to the action. But eventually, um, this is the last slide, but eventually then the, the idea to produce a kind of uh, uh, you know, beautiful, uh, somewhat, somewhat enigmatic, somewhat powerful architectural statement within a, within a spirit of a, of a person like that who uh, makes it a very, very important sort of work, uh, not only in the art historical context, but you realize how his friendship to life, and, and I think the key to him being, I, I, you know, besides what he ate, which I used to watch, every time I'm in a meeting, I just say, what do you eat, you know? Um, and he smokes a pipe every day still, so he doesn't stop. Um, but I think the most important thing of all, uh, in terms of that man's character, is this unbelievable optimism about everything, and the fact that with the art and people, he galvanized some very, very important friendships throughout his entire life that he turns to all the time. And even though he's lost a lot of friends, he has this fantastic sort of spirit about him. So I think that, I just want to say, unbelievably important, the idea of friends in architecture, not just as connections or as help, but really this idea that we, we have a sort of powerful relation to the work we do, um, and, and, we, and it is important that our human relations uh, work at the same kind of level of the, of the, uh, of the sort of love affair we have with, with architecture. Okay, that's it for my talk. Thank you very much. so many talks and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm sitting here with a nerve. Very strange. But nice to be here. <laughs> um, questions? No, then don't ask me what the first uh, sort of course curriculum is. <laughs> no, anyone have, go ahead if you have anything you'd like to know or ask about the work. Um, I had a little bit of, you know, I tried to structure this talk a little bit uh, based on the fact that last week I showed a number of other things very quickly. Um, and I thought that maybe it's, uh, you know, I would, I would keep this one a little bit more strange um, and, and more pertinent. Uh, so if you have any questions about last week or this week or next week, or when my flight is. Or... <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Well, you know, I, I think one of the reasons I, I put Peter Sanders at the end of this talk and thought about it when I was watching his video, and I have a lot of video, but you know, it's the beauty of the iPhone now, it's like, he's talking and you're filming, um, is that he never talks about any of this. I, 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 you know, I don't think it, the word exists in his vocabulary. I'm not saying he's a paradigm of, of, sort of, of, uh, of, of the situation, but I think what was interesting is to see someone who saw a struggling artist in 1937 named Appel, buys him some paint, figures out how to work with him, guy gives him some important work, of course. His house is full of Soto, Gab, Gabo, Epson, I mean, all these people. In other words, every time he saw inspiration, they became a friend. Uh, and I, I actually asked him once, is there anyone that you didn't like? And he has like a story, maybe about some anecdote about someone, but I think the fact is that he doesn't, in his collective memory, doesn't collect, uh, sort of will, will allow enemies to not be part of the collective memory, which I think is kind of important. I mean, we, we come across people all the time who, are against us, or, uh, and, and there are, I was, you know, okay, I had a cynical talk too. I had uh, all the slides of the competing firms for Yongsan ready to go. You know, I just pulled them, I, you saw me in here earlier pulling slides. The last minute I thought, ah, you know, I don't think I need to show John Jerdy and Daniel Wittestund and, uh, you know, SOM's work 
uh, prove a point about friends and enemies. I think it's just the fact is that maybe it's, they just don't exist. <laughs> It's just a kind, they exist, of course, the kind of corporate firms that one would imagine are kind of against a firm like ours or, or in these kind of competitions. But I don't think the word enemy applies necessarily, and I don't think it's, uh, I don't think one gets to go to the next project with a kind of sense of enthusiasm and drive and desire if you're constantly aware of those that are against you. Um, it's better to look forward into, into those that you have affiliation with. Oh, what the enemy is in ideas are yeah. uh, environmental sustainability, big enemy. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm half joking on that. But I, I guess um, in terms of ideas, uh, well, banality. Banality is an enemy. Um, conventionality is an enemy. Uh, you know, uh, corporate culture in some ways, again, is a kind of enemy. Uh, but they're enemies in the sense that they're not uh, enemies in the sense that you have to fight them. They're enemies in the sense of what you steer clear of. Uh, I think that's maybe another way of looking at it. Uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say about the Sanders thing and about the work is that it's difficult to maintain in this discipline over years uh, a kind of naive optimism. It's a really tough thing because you're being knocked down every five minutes by something. Um, but I think that in, in many ways, if you can keep the optimistic side of that, have less of a naivete, you can move further and further into the field in a more and more compelling way, produce more and more beautiful work. I mean, I think that, you know, and I don't know, maybe some of you like it and don't like it in terms of the hotel in Abu Dhabi, but I think the only way we could have produced that project was a kind of a, uh, a real belief in, 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 uh, in trying to, under incredible constraints, by the way, I mean, it may look like we had unlimited budgets and, a, you know, and a kind of crazy clients, and it was exactly the opposite. The budget was strict, the clients were tough as hell out there, the people you work with are, are incredibly difficult. Um, but what drove us all the time is the fact that we, we sort of only looked at the fact that we could, that there was a way somehow structurally, technologically, architecturally to produce something outside of those enemies um, of it becoming banal or it becoming another kind of, you know, I mean, the box. In our, in our discipline right now, uh, and that's in, in the way why I uh, took on the, uh, the, auto, the crematorium the way we did, the box is a kind of enemy. I mean, we, we've lost so many competitions in the past couple of years to horrendously boring boxes. Um, and, you know, you ask yourself, well, okay, maybe there's a problem with, with, you know, because what happens is it becomes an easy way to understand economy and building and, and people kind of, you know, juries, particularly naive juries, will just say, oh, that's, that's buildable, that isn't. You know, they don't kind of understand. And I think that in many ways the, the gravitational pull on, on Yaz was not towards a box necessarily, but towards a kind of two spheres or two domes. You know, we had a lot of struggle to maintain you know, 5,680 different size panel uh, dimensions and produce an amorphic surface. And we, know, we all know, you all know this from the work you do in the schools. I mean, it's architecturally, you can model that, you can produce something beautiful, but then when you actually have to move within 14 months to get it constructed, uh, and you go through all the hoops you go through, there are so many potential things that gnaw away at it. So in many ways, I think that yeah, I mean, there are, there are enemies and conceptual enemies that hover around you all the time. Um, and sometimes I wear them on my shoulder when I'm in design meetings, and on the other side is a conceptual angel, and I figure out you know, which one I should be listening to. Because um, sometimes you have to listen to this one. It's a pain in the ass, but if you, <laughs> to get projects through and do things. I don't know if I'm answering the question the way you'd like it answered, but I, I think that's, that's really the way I, I see the... the uh, the ability to continue to produce and be excited about the things you produce and to work and not let yourself get sort of eroded by the forces um, that are, you know, pretty strong you know, in, this, in this profession. Come on. <laughs> um, let me see. Let me ask myself a question. Mm. Um, I'm sure you have something else to ask me. Yes. How are you so big? Why do I like to teach? Why do I like to teach? <laughs> Loaded question. Um, I, uh, I started out, you know, the day I finished graduate school, I got a teaching position um, in Como, Italy. 
And uh, I'll tell the story. Why not? Jeff's going to hate me for it. I'm going to tell the story. And I, uh, I, get, I get flown to Italy. It's the first job. I'm 26 years old. And uh, I end up uh, walking into a studio in the Asilo Turan. Beautiful little building. And there's all these students sitting there uh, looking at May lights. Remember those days? And, uh, and, they're, and they're like sitting around, and it's like 60, 80, 100 students. I don't know, it's incredible. And they're all sitting in New Zealand. And I, said, I looked at I walk around, and I said, what's going on here? What am I supposed to do? And they said, well, you're the guy who's going to teach us, right? And I'm like, yeah, but where are your real teachers? Because I was actually just coming in to assist. And he goes, oh, you mean Libeski? No, he's at the cafe with Peter Eisenman. And Jeff's over there, too. And they're all hanging out. And they've been there you know, for the whole week. And I said, so you don't have any teachers? They said, well, you know. He signed on, and, and I realized politically that what I had to do was like go into high gear and sort of make up because these guys were, you know, I respected them all, and also they were friends, or beginning to be friends. And so I just started teaching like a maniac, and I realized that it was kind of great. It's, it's a little bit like, you know, the equivalent in our discipline to what an athlete would have to go through in terms of physical and circuit training. Uh, it's a constant repeat and um, and sort of uh, and sort of. Uh, 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 the idea of exercises and drills and knowing your keys and all those things, all those different sort of analogies we use in other disciplines, whether it's studying music or studying athletics or, or, or philosophy for that matter. And I, I got into it and enjoyed it. And I think ever since then, I, I just always, and I've always seen a very strong connection between teaching and what, well, you worked in my office for what, three years? <laughs> and I've always seen a really strong connection between the atelier um, and the atelier of, and, and the school as a kind of academic place, which is a kind of fake atelier. I mean, what's great about school is that you're in a sort of, um, art, you're in an artificially controlled atelier environment. Um, once you go out into the real world, it, it becomes a little bit more different. It's a little, little different. But I think I always tried to find a way to make the school more like a real office and the office like a real school um, and try and get things to merge together. And that's what I've, you know, yeah, it's uh, it's an addiction. It's uh, it's just part of a you know. It's like it's like you ask somebody why do they run or why do you uh, you know do do something to keep your heart moving. Right? It's, it's it's teaching. It's really a kind of natural necessity in terms of making architecture. Besides, students are always have the the most radical and, and far fetched ideas, which are you know it's, it's where in fact it's where the real research takes place is in the, in the academies and schools and the good ones. Um, and that's where the edges get pushed and the envelopes get pushed. It's pretty hard to be pushing envelopes, you know, at the office all the time. That's Jeff. Did he tell that story about Coleman? I'm going to kill him. Um, I'll tell you a funny story about Jeff. This is totally, a, this is completely nothing. I was there, um, I don't know if you want this on film, and uh, do you remember, remember a very good architect at the time? His name was Baram Shurda. Anyone remember Baram? Fantastic. I don't know where he is. Anyone know where Baram is? Like, no. So Baram was a, you know, Iranian guy, very smart, very, very savvy, very kind of bourgeois, you know. And uh, he, he was at the swimming pool, of course, because they were all on leisure time while I was teaching. And um, he lost his wallet uh, at the pool in Como. So he, um, so he comes back scrambling, he's freaking out because of all his credit cards, his, you know, everything. And he comes scrambling and I'm standing talking to Jeff Kipnis and, and Baram says, yeah, I lost my wallet, I'm in big trouble, I have no, you know, I don't do it. Baram goes, uh, Jeff goes to me, he says, you speak Italian, right? I said, yeah. He goes, you just repeat everything I say and I will look after this whole thing. And off we go to the pool and the first thing Jeff says in English is to the guy, I am with the FBI. <laughs> and if you don't, you know, if you don't sort of, you know, find this man's wallet, I will have you and everyone else in this pool arrested. And I'm Louis uh, from the uh, FDE, you know, <laughs> totally going through this. But that was amazing. I, don't know. I mean, it's an anecdote that has nothing to do with, oh, it's for friends, yeah. I mean, there, was, there was, you know, true friendship, uh, pretending to be an FBI agent and helping your fellow colleague get his wallet back. Uh, and then using me as this kind of kid scrambling my broken Italian to try and convince and they believed that Jeff looked like he was with the FBI. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. In uh, cities. <coughs> I, I think um, 
Well, a lot of these things are driven by, by what people bring to the table. But I, I you know, and he goes, he goes, so you're an architect? Yeah, he goes, okay. So uh, did you design cities? I said, well, yeah, I'm interested in cities. Me too, me too. Waste management, what do you do about waste management? <laughs> I'm not trying to, I'm trying to like, you know, keep a pace here with the guy. I'm looking at my heart monitor going, I'm dead. I can't believe it's going to stop. And, and the guy's like, I'm going, uh, uh, let me, we'll talk about when we stop. And he's like, okay, okay, transport. What about transport? Electric vehicles. So, you know, by the time this ride was over, I, I sit with him at, the, at this little place in Shelter Island, and I said, okay, so what's the deal? You know, the whole ride, you're killing, you're killing him with these questions. He goes, oh, well, he goes, I own, you know, a few billion dollars of hedge funds. I'm a hedge fund guy. And... We're, build, we're looking to build, you know, we're looking to do city space. We're really interested in all the developments and the funding and the investments around that stuff. I'm like, you're kidding. I, who's, who are you? You know, and I started to find more and more about this guy. And it's become very interesting who he is. Um, so, that's how I got into cities. I, I was <laughs> 168 beats a minute. I figured out that I'm going to look at cities in a very serious way. And since then, we've, we've actually been doing a lot of... Uh, <laughs> work with uh, his group and now another group out of Silicon Valley um, that are looking at a kind of interesting development in contemporary urbanism. We talked about this today in the, in the review, is that um, all of a sudden you have these empowered places like China and the, the Emirates, you know, parts, you know, maybe other parts in the East potentially, and maybe even other places like Alberta, where oil, you know, not so much Alberta, but in China and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and the Emirates, they have this kind of, well, Mazdar City is a case in point. They have the potential and the desire and the means to do remarkably large projects from the ground up. And the other thing that I thought about a lot when he was talking about this and later in the coffee I had with him and the, and the other stuff he was giving me to recover, um, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the conversation going around to a, a, a conversation that I remember hearing at Harvard when I was teaching at the GSD. I was sitting in the faculty lounge. Um, and the table next to me were these eight guys uh, who had just come off of their day of teaching. I was sitting alone, having my dinner. And I couldn't help, you know, what we all do, right? It's like, okay, what's the movie script over here? And uh, these eight guys start, as they drank more and more dinner, they, they were all high-end, very high-level automotive engineers. And as they drank more and more of the dinner and got more and more kind of plastered, uh, they spoke more and more. They got into this whole anecdotal conversation about car design without the traditional car as we know it. Like, what would happen? And it was amazing. I just, I'd always wished I could have had an iPhone at that time that would have taped this conversation because they were going through incredible hoops and, and, and scenarios of what automotive culture would be like without the wagon and the road and the four wheels and the things that have now just become staples that we're consume, continually trying to remedy, right, with fuel and so on. And, and it was really fascinating. And I, and I remember thinking anecdotally to myself, well, if we could design urban cities from scratch, would it be a similar conversation? What kind of experts would you bring to the table? And how would you start to discuss urbanism if, in fact, vehicles are not the way we know them, and, uh, and again, waste management works in a certain way, and energy works in a certain way, and infrastructure works in a certain way, and then these guys I talked to the most recently who are talking about, believe it or not, city apps, which is something I can tell you about when we start working together. Um, but this idea that cities have like apps the way we have apps in our iPhones, um, it's, fast, it's, it's a kind of a fascinating uh, topic, and we're in a. And I think the other thing that got me interested was the fact that these tools we're using, these computer tools and, and design, have kind of reached their limit in many ways, as far as I'm concerned. Not reached their limit, but we're seeing the same thing repeated over and over in many ways in terms of design approach. Yes, nuances of better and worse, and there are two avenues which are critical now. I think of computing that we're beginning to work towards and are into, and you have it here with. Uh, with the studios you already have running and, and have running with the world, is that it's how you make this stuff now is getting interesting. How you get it into the ground, get it built, not just have it exist on the screen. Because all you have to do is you know call up design.com or art, you know, or one of or whatever the design boom or whatever, and you'll just see the endless archy porn, you know, sort of stream past you. Everybody's able to do something interesting. So it's one avenue is how we get the stuff built, how manufacturing worked. The other one is, is a whole new one in many ways. It's how to utilize all these tools, parametric tools, computing, visual, tech, to designing cities. Um, and, and it's a tool that we never had before to look at that problem. I was, again, at lunch I was joking, we were, joking, we were talking a little bit about the, the, the famous you know, Costa 
Nervi, Brasilia, the, the sketch on the napkin, you know, the bird, um, you know, that starts, it's the city of Brasilia, right? It's kind of a, uh, an utterance. Well, if you start to think about the, the abilities to, to discuss and be discerning and to produce with digital techniques and technologies and bring all the things into play, you have a very interesting potential. So yeah, that's one. So it's a combination of those things. Yes? So yeah, you guys are warming up now. This is good. <laughs> um, so you're coming to the end as you teach, and um, I'm curious as to your relationship with this series. Um, is it supposed to bring the inspiration for you? Uh, yeah. Good one. Um, <laughs> I mean, one can't help but be inspired here. It's a pretty, pretty uh, fantastic place architecturally. I mean, I came here as a student. I came here in undergrad, in grad school. I came here, you know, many times uh, you know, at school. Uh, I had friends who worked at Hans Holine's office. I had ex-employees who worked at Wall's <laughs> I, I have, uh, you know, a long relationship with this place in that sense. But I think um, what, what I found was only yesterday was a new thing I, I, I found about the end, which is um, I, I'm staying in the uh, Sofitel Hotel. And you know, to be 15 floors up or in the, or in the Pippilo Terris, fantastic kind of dining. And John did a fantastic job at the um, You see Vienna uh, as a kind of a, you know, as a, as a kind of a hyper Google map. <laughs> I am sitting this morning having breakfast with my iPad doing the Google map satellite thing and looking out the window at the city. And you know, it's, it's, a, you know you can, it's an amazing opportunity. I don't know if there's been buildings that high residentially or where you could just sort of stay. Or so to see the city as a kind of 3D, this shows you how weird it is, as a high definition 3D image, <laughs> which is real, um, and to be able to couple that with an augmented reality of it, to work with the iPad and quickly sort of, because I was trying to figure out where this place was from there, and where I had to go here, and there, where I could run. And where, so it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a new way of seeing the city that's kind of fascinating. So it's interesting to think about that in a city with such a remarkable history, but in terms of augmented reality and, and the potential future. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a fascinating place for that reason. You know, it's, you know, it's a beautiful place. So yeah, I'm very, I mean, look, I, I have never applied for a teaching, <coughs> teaching job, okay? I, I gotta let you know this. I never ever technically applied for a teaching job. This was the first teaching job I ever applied for. Um, because I really wanted it. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't sort of like, "Hello, this is Bob Stern. Would you like to come to Yale?" You know, Hello, this is you know, years ago Bernard Chumi. Now this was more like, uh, "Wolf, what's going on? There's a position," and he's like, mm -hmm. yeah. "This is where I want to." So, because of the city, the place, the students. Uh, and you, yeah, it's going to be interesting. All right, so um, is, that, is that enough for today? <laughs> Thank you very much.